the first chapter of the Analytic of Principles is called, in the Geyer and Woods translation, On the Clue to the Discovery of All Pure Concepts of the Understanding. On the Clue to the Discovery of All Pure Concepts of the Understanding. And I want to say two things about that. The first is that clue is maybe not the most happy translation here. Uh, the German word is Leitfaden, which is more like, like a guiding thread, right? Something that brings you to a specific point. So that might, might be a bit stronger than the word clue con currently is in English. Anyway, so what Kant is going to do in this chapter is he is going to tell us how we are to discover all pure concepts of the understanding. So all the concepts of the understanding that are, in a sense, in it a priori that don't need to wait for any empirical data uh, before they become applicable to objects. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to say about this, uh, uh, the title of this chapter. And the second thing I want to say about it is that actually this chapter is generally known under a different name. It is generally known as the metaphysical deduction. So why? Well, after this metaphysical deduction, we will come to the transcendental deduction. Uh, and Kant says in the B edition of the book that, uh, well, he refers back to this chapter as the metaphysical deduction. And so I think people prefer this nice symmetry, right? First, we have a metaphysical deduction and then we have a transcendental deduction. So generally, like sometimes you will hear people talk maybe about the clue chapter or something like that, but generally people in the Kant literature call this part of the book the metaphysical deduction. Now, I don't want to talk too much about this term deduction, uh, what exactly it means, because Kant is going to explain that only later on when we get to the transcendental deduction. Uh, but what I do want to do is I want to start out by giving you an idea of what this transcend sorry what this metaphysical deduction is trying to do what is the point what does kant want to achieve here and then we will look in more detail at those nice little schemes that kant sets up right with his 12 logical functions of the understanding and judgment and then his famous 12 categories which are somehow supposed to be the a priori content of the understanding Okay, so what does Kant want to do here? Well, as we have just seen, Kant, the whole point of the transcendental logic, or at least of the transcendental analytic, is to find out what the understanding is going to bring to all cognition of objects, right? What is it that we can a priori know that the understanding will bring to all cognition of objects? Or in other words, what are the, the, the concepts or the judgments that we can know a priori will apply to any object that will be cognized or can be cognized by us human beings, right? We are interested in what makes it possible for us to cognize objects. Now, no longer seen from the point of view of sensibility as in the aesthetic, but from the point of view of the understanding. Okay, so what is the understanding, right? And what could be a priori about it? Well, Kant, uh, in a sense, makes a distinction between three levels here of the understanding or of reason. Again, his terminology is, is a little bit fluid here. Um, at the most basic level, Kant tells us the understanding is cognition through concepts, right? That's an important word here. It is cognition through concepts. And so Kant tells us that all intuitions as sensible rest on affections, concepts, therefore, on functions. Um, by a function, however, I understand the unity of the action of ordering different representations under a common one. Concepts are therefore grounded on the spontaneity of thinking. Now the understanding can make no other use of these concepts than of judging by means of them. Blah, blah, blah. Judgment is therefore the immediate cognition of an object, hence the representation of a representation of it. Okay, what's going on here? Well, one thing that might clear up uh, one, I would say, very surprising sentence, which is, um, 
I think the first sentence I read, that all intuitions as sensible rest on affections, concepts therefore on functions, is that that word therefore should not be taken too seriously. Because Kant himself, in his first edition copy, uh, like crossed out with pen or pencil this word therefore, also in German, and turned it into aber, which would mean but. So it's maybe this sentence is supposed to say all intuitions rest on affections, but concepts on functions. Okay, what's that? Well, a function, like generally speaking, a function is something that performs a certain task, right? Uh, it's something that allows us to reach a particular kind of goal. Uh, so the function of the heart is to pump the blood around in the body so that oxygen and, um, and other important things can get everywhere. That is the function of the heart. And so when we think about, when we think about functions, um, like functions of judgment, as Kant is going to say, uh, well, we're going to think about different ways in which we, we can do something, in which we can achieve certain ends um, in the combination of, of representations. Okay, now the way that Kant defines it here is he says, by a function, I understand the unity of the action of ordering different representations under a common one. And as I also uh, read out, um, judgment is therefore the immediate cognition of an object, hence the representation of a representation of it. Here is, here is one way of thinking about this, right? A concept is always and necessarily something general. We already saw that in the transcendental aesthetic. That was part of Kant's argument that space and time are intuitions and not concepts. They're general. Different objects can fall under them, right? The concept of green, whoa, all these different green objects, those that are real and those that are merely possible, fall under them. Uh, the concept of body, wow, that's even more general, right? So lots and lots of, uh, of, uh, of objects could fall under that. This is true for every concept. Even if, uh, in a sense, only one thing can fall under it, it is still sort of by means of, of, of claiming something general, by means of this general representation that I, I catch this, this single object. Right? When I think of the king of France, well, there is no king of France, right? That's the point of the example. The point of all examples with the king of France in philosophy is that there is no king of France. The queen of England, that's the kind of example that I want. Um, the queen of England, right? That's a particular object. But I'm thinking this particular object in a sort of general way, right? In terms of queens, um, like there, there could be other queens of England. Um, there have been other queens of England. So even if my, my, my concept applies to only one object, it is still, in a certain sense, general. Concepts arising from spontaneity, I mean, they're part of the action of the understanding in human beings, and so they don't generate or create their own objects. And so they're going to be free-floating, and they're not going to apply to objects unless I apply them to objects that are like ultimately given in intuition, right? So I can apply concepts to the objects that are given to me in intuition. And so that is why Kant says that judgment is the immediate cognition of an object, right? It's not immediate. I do not sort of grasp it without anything coming, coming between me and the grasping. The concept applies to an intuition or to another concept under which I maybe after a couple of steps come to an intuition. Um, there's something between me and the object, right? And that's, that's maybe the intuition, maybe the intuition and some other concepts, but there's always some mediation occurring here. That's the way that we human beings think of things. We have these general terms that in the end through intuition uh, are going to apply to the objects that we are cognizing. Okay. Now, what Kant, when Kant talks about, about understanding or reason, um, he tends to think of that as in sort of three, we could say, hierarchical steps, right? There's concepts, 
which we apply to, to maybe a particular object. Um, but we combine concepts into judgments, right? A judgment is something like all animals are alive, or some animals are alive, or this animal is alive, or, well, you know, anything that can be judged to be true or false would be a judgment, right? And judgments like are built up out of concepts and so we are sort of one step higher up in the hierarchy we have concepts but we built them up into um into judgments and then we can chain judgments together into arguments right we can get from one judgment to another judgment and that is what reason in sort of the proper narrow sense is all about it is about taking different judgments and getting from them to new and other judgments. Um, and so that is maybe a third step in the hierarchy. There's sort of concepts, there's judgments, and then we have these relations between judgments, which um, we could call arguments or, or reasoning. Now, okay, having said that, let's think about what Kant wants to do in a metaphysical deduction, right? Here, Kant is interested in concepts. What he wants to do in the first part of the analytic, they, uh, in the analytic of concepts, is he wants to find out whether there are um, any concepts that apply a priori in all cognition of objects. Right? Are there any concepts that we can know in advance apply to our cognition of objects because they are sort of that which makes the cognition of objects possible, right? This is the, the, the transcendental move, the whole move of Kant's philosophy. Can we find any concepts, like which are the fundamental concepts that make cognition of objects possible? Kant is going to say yes. And the metaphysical deduction, so the chapter that we are reading right now, is where he wants to give us a list of those concepts. Right? What the metaphysical deduction wants to do is it wants to give us a list, or a table really, uh, of all the fundamental concepts that are the possibilities, um, that are the conditions of possibility for all cognition of objects. Right? We want to have the concepts and all the concepts that allow us to cognize objects. So that is what Kant wants to do. And that is why it's called on the clue to the discovery of all pure concepts of the understanding, right? The pure concepts of the understanding, that's the concept that we are uh, after. And we want to discover all of them. And not only that, we also want to know that we have all of them. Well, how could we do that, right? I mean, we can sort of maybe, maybe think what are some really general concepts? And then maybe try to argue that they are a priori. But if we, if we go about it that way, we can never know that we have all of them. Right? We need some systematic way of understanding which concepts there have to be sort of a priori in our understanding um, to make the cognition of objects possible. How do we do that? Well, Kant says, first, we've got to think about what is the understanding, like fundamentally. And once we know what the understanding is fundamentally, maybe that is going to allow us to see what a priori concepts there have to be. Well, what is the understanding fundamentally? Okay, it, it uses concepts. That is one thing that we've just seen. Well, Kant says... The understanding in general can be represented as a faculty for judging. Right? We are at A69, B94 here. And here Kant is telling us what the understanding fundament fundamentally is. The understanding in general can be represented as a faculty for judging. For according to what has been said above, it is a faculty for thinking. Thinking is cognition through concepts. Concepts, however, are predicates of possible judgments, are related to some representation of a still undeterred, as predicates of possible judgments, 
are related to some representation of a still undetermined object. The concept of body does signify something, for instance metal, which can be cognized through that concept. It is therefore a concept only because other representations are contained under it by means of which it can be related to objects. It is therefore the predicate for a possible judgment, for instance every metal is a body. The functions of the understanding can therefore all be found together if one can exhaustively exhibit the functions of unity in judgments. The following section will make it evident that this can readily be accomplished. Okay, what is Kant claiming here? So, the fa understanding is the faculty for, I mean, it uses concepts, right? It's a faculty for using concepts, but Kant goes on to argue concepts are predicates of a possible judgment, right? That's what a concept is. It is something that we can use to judge. A concept is something under which other things fall. And that is what we do in a judgment, right? In a judgment, like all A's are B's, we are showing that one thing, A's, falls under something else, B's. In a judgment like this A is B, we again, we show that something, A, falls under something else, B. That is what judgment is. And a concept is only a concept. If things fall under it, that is, if it can be used in judgment. right? And so Kant is going to say that, you know, if we think about it, um, the understanding as a faculty for concepts really is a faculty for judging. That is what it does. Right? It, it, yes, it uses concepts. Yes, it makes judgments. But concepts just are elements of possible judgments. And so we can sort of get this all together in the claim that the understanding is the faculty for judging. Now, a judgment is a unity, right? A judgment, when I think all bodies are divisible or all trees are plants, all trees are plants, right? I'm not just thinking all, oh, that's a lot. Trees, oh, nice, trees are a bit vague. Plants, oh, I love plants. I mean, that's not what's going on, right? I don't have like four concepts or something like that. Um, that I think in a in a row or in a sequence, and that you know are are and that's it. No, I mean what I'm doing in a judgment is precisely that I'm bringing these things together. I'm bringing trees and plants. Those are are the concepts here. I think Kant would say, uh, I'm bringing trees and plants together. Right, that's the whole point of the judgment. And when I say all trees are plants, I'm bringing those things together in a particular way. All trees are plants. That's bringing things together in a particular way. There are other ways of bringing them together. Some trees are plants. That's a different way. Trees are not plants. That's that's another different way. Trees might be plants. That's yet another way of bringing them together. So there are lots of ways of bringing those things together. Um, and that is what a judgment does, what a judgment is. Like formally speaking, like if we abstract away from the content, from the actual concepts, that are used, a judgment is a way of bringing concepts together into a unity. And so what we have to ask, if we want to know, like, what is, what are the fundamental a priori concepts of cognition, what makes it possible for us to think objects, that is, to apply concepts to what is given to us, what we need to understand are the ways in which these unities can be formed. So when Kant says that what we have to find are the functions of unity in judgment, that's what he's talking about. All the ways in which concepts can be combined into this unity that is a judgment. Well, he thinks that that can be done and that we can show what are these ways, so what are these functions, these most basic functions of the judgment itself, completely abstracted away from, from any particular content, and he's going to be able to give them to us in a table. And that is what he does in paragraph 9 here, like immediately after the quote that I just read you out. 
Um, and so that's great, and we're going to look at that. What's the plan for, for the chapter as a whole? Well, the plan for the chapter as a whole is this, right? Kant first wants to argue, as he has just done, that if there are these a priori concepts, they are going to be these functions of unity in judgment, these ways in which judgments can be sort of brought together into a single thought. That's what we need to find. So then, in paragraph 9, on the logical function of the understanding in judgments, Kant is going to tell us about that. He's going to tell us, well, what are these functions of judgment? That's nice. But that's not enough. Because we are not interested... I mean, this is general logic. Right? This is general logic. Here, like the functions of the understanding in judgments is merely about what what does any judgment have to be like right what are the possible forms of judgment what are the mental activities the mental acts that we have to be capable of in order to form all these kinds of judgments that's nice but we want to do transcendental logic right we want to relate this to the conditions of possibility for the cognition of objects and that's missing from paragraph 9 that's what paragraph 10 is going to do on the pure concepts of the understanding or categories, right? The categories are going to be um, the concepts that we get, really, when we, uh, when we take the functions of the understanding and judgments and take them up in transcendental logic and think about what they become when they are used in a judgment about objects that are given to us, right? And so the second table the table of categories is like a mirror image or or a transformation really of the table of the logical functions because it are the same logical functions but now applied to objects and so we are going to look at that too and we are going to think about how good Kant's tables are by talking a little bit about the relation between Kant on the one hand and our contemporary logic on the other hand